Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am honored and privileged to be talking with Nicholas Dirks. Nicholas is a historian and anthropologist by training. He has a bachelor's from Wesleyan University and master's and PhD at the University of Chicago. He is currently the president and CEO of the New York Academy of Sciences, one of the oldest scientific organizations in the United States. And he was the 10th chancellor of the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, before that, he was also the uh, vice president for the arts and sciences and dean of faculty at Columbia University. And he was also a professor of history and anthropology at University of Michigan for a few years. And he's also taught at uh, California Institute of Technology. He has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, MacArthur Foundation Residential Fellowship at Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he has honorary degrees uh, uh, in China and in India and is the senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is the author of four major books. He's edited at least three others, and with, along with numerous essays, articles, and papers. And uh, so he is quite established. Uh, we start this conversation by talking about his background as Chancellor Berkeley um, and being the dean of various other academic institutions and, and a lot of the experience that he brings at, from, from uh, higher ed. We talk about some of the problems and solutions for higher ed. We talk about why we still need the liberal arts and the humanities. We talk about free speech and the ongoing culture wars and really what his perspective you know, running many, many big um, higher education institutions, what his perspective is on, on some of these uh, uh, cultural issues. We, towards the end of the conversation, talk about COVID and the whole trust the science slogan. And really, we talk about, you know, misinformation and disinformation, but we talk about how to have accurate um, and effective um, science communication and why science communication for the public is really, really important. It's something that I feel passionate about. It's something that he feels passionate about. Um, and so we talk about that. I got to say it was really, really uh, wonderful to talk to Nicholas. He's a, a brilliant uh, person. He's uh, absolutely uh, wonderful and very nice um, and, and very giving of his time. And uh, I really, really did enjoy uh, the conversation I had with him. Uh, and really just kind of downloading his experience and wisdom and knowledge. And so it was, it was an absolute honor. Uh, as always, you can get uh, this conversation and all other conversations at my free Substack, convergendialogues.substack.com. So subscribe over there. And uh, now I bring you Nicholas Dirks. I am here with Nicholas Dirks. Uh, Nicholas, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Great to yeah. be here. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So uh, for listeners that don't know who you are, um, kind of uh, say what your kind of potted biography is. Uh, so what is your, uh, what is uh, kind of your experience or background, um, you know, kind of, I guess, historically, and then I guess more recently, uh, and what you're thinking about and writing about uh, these days? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, my background is basically I've been an academic almost all of my life. Uh, I got um, interested in India when I was a kid and spent a year there. So I got to studying things about India when I was in college and then went on to basically do a PhD in South Asian history and anthropology. And um, that's what I did. I, I, I spent a lot of time in India in the 70s and 80s in particular doing research on things ranging from the nature of the caste system to the history of different kingdoms and the kind of uh, nature of both the state and society and the relations between the two. Uh, and I taught at Caltech, which was great for somebody in history and anthropology, because I got to teach these incredibly smart students who were staying up all night to do their physics homework for Richard Feynman. <laughs> uh, uh, but then I, I moved uh, in the mid 80s to the University of Michigan, late 80s to the University of Michigan, mm. set up a joint PhD program in history and anthropology, my two disciplines, but also to make it possible for students to study in a kind of cross disciplinary way. Mm. 
uh, for my sins of succeeding in building a program, I was uh, recruited to Columbia, where I chaired the anthropology department, first department of anthropology in the United States, uh, set up, established in the 1890s by Franz Boas, a kind of legendary figure in the field of anthropology who trained students as various as Margaret Mead, hmm. Ruth Benedict, Zora Neale Hurston, A.L. Kroeber, uh, Melville Herskovitz, a lot of the major figures in the field, also figures who went on either to do things like Margaret Mead and, and Ruth Benedict popularize anthropology, or others who went on like Krober and Herskovitz to set up the major programs in anthropology across other universities in the in the U.S. Uh, and um, once again, uh, had a good time and did, I think, some good things. So uh, the president, who just had come in from the University of Michigan, asked me to become the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. So I wow. had to hang up my, uh, you know, my uh, fieldwork hat uh, and uh, uh, reduce my time in archives, uh, and became the dean of the faculty of uh, faculty in thirty different departments. Uh, had deans from six different schools uh, reporting in. Uh, began to learn about the university as a, as a whole, took a much more synoptic view of mm. what people in chemistry and physics and uh, evolutionary biology were doing on the one side and, you know, philosophy and linguistics and uh, and literary studies uh, on the other. Uh, and uh, in the in the course of that, became just incredibly interested in in the university. So began increasingly to train my historical and anthropological lens onto the university. Um, after doing that job for about eight and a half years, I was asked to go to the University of California, Berkeley to be chancellor. Mm. And, uh, you know, Berkeley and the world of academia, as you know, has always been like the, the place uh, where major intellectual things happen. It also happens to be a public university. So it, in a way, combines uh, the two things that I found most compelling about any university, that is to say, a really great place with lots of different fields, with very talented faculty, extraordinary students, and a place that was uh, genuinely committed to diversity, to uh, public, you know, to a public outreach, uh, to a public mission. Uh, so I moved from New York to California, did that for close to five years, uh, had some fun times uh, uh, experiencing what life as a chancellor in a public university system without uh, quite as much money sloshing around as used to be the case back in the uh, good old days for public higher education. Mm -hmm. I found myself uh, in interesting conversations with uh, people from political backgrounds I'd never really interacted with before, people like Jerry Brown, governor of California on the one side, and Janet Napolitano, president of the UC system on the other, former secretary of Home Homeland Security, and of course, governor before that of Arizona. So I did that, and uh, after uh, after doing my uh, my time on the front front lines, I I stepped down, thought I'd go back to teach, and then got the opportunity to come back to New York to lead the New York Academy of Sciences. So I uh, happened to fall into one thing after the next, but uh, have had a wonderful set of institutions where I've worked, where I've taught, where I've. Uh, done research and uh, and and ultimately where I did academic administration and now I'm uh, in another uh, very wonderful old institution, but no students, no faculty, no alumni. Mm. So you know I'm a little freer now than I would mm. used to be. Sure, yeah, that is quite the career. It's it's, it's incredible. It's it's uh, really really incredible. Um, well, it's, it's I have I have many questions for you uh, just before I, I get into them. I mean. Uh, it's interesting about your kind of your early beginnings. Uh, I've had a few uh, folks on here. I, I, you must know uh, William de Rimple, who who has written books on on India. He was he was uh, lovely. Um, I don't know if you know Joe Henrik, who's who's also an anthropologist. He was at Harvard. Uh, he's not. I don't think art anthropology proper. He has a, a lot of crossover in many things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've, I've talked to a lot of different people in that old uh, in your kind of like uh, early part of your career, and. Um, I, I am curious about your time at uh, at Berkeley, of course. I mean, obviously, I was known as the kind of you know free speech, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, oasis of sorts in the '60s and '70s. And I know it's had a lot of uh, evolution over the past uh, couple of years. So it's, it's very interesting to hear 
um, you know, kind of from from your perspective. And then, yeah, about your work now, I I guess the the question here, the thread of all of that is, it seems as you were mentioning there that now your focus or your aim is on how do we communicate good science to the public, right? Especially if you're being part of the you know, New York Academy of Sciences. Uh, I guess that bit of it, and more broadly, what do you see as kind of you know this part of your career, uh, kind of your major uh, points of emphasis? Yeah, well, thank you. You know, um, just speaking of Berkeley, and we'll get to that in a minute, uh, some of it is evolution and some of it is revolution or revolution. So, uh, you know, those two things kind of exist in point counterpoint uh, when you're when you're thinking about Berkeley as a, as, as a kind of iconic institution. Um, but yeah, you know, as an academic, you know, my principal uh, preoccupation was teaching students uh, and writing academic articles and uh, and 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 books uh, and so my interest in communication was largely through either the classroom or through you know research papers and and research findings and and the like so for the first part of my career i didn't think very much about communicating anything very much to the broader public uh, you know, obviously, like any uh, any anybody growing up in the '60s, I, I uh, you know, I had a lot of interest in the world of public affairs. And uh, the first time I ever uh, went into the office of a president of a college or a university was when I was not invited, uh, but went there along with my fellow students as an undergraduate to protest military recruitment on campus um, mm. around the war in Vietnam. Mm. And uh, and yet, you know, when I then went on to graduate school and had my first my first job. So I was uh, I was really you know trying to address major subjects in the field of the study of India, but again for uh, primarily a, either an academic audience or an audience of students, either undergraduates or for that matter graduate students who were going to go on and do advanced research of their own. So uh, it was only really first at Columbia and then really at Berkeley that you know i began to think about the need to communicate to the public more broadly mm. uh, and of course as a chancellor you have to do that all the time uh, right. you're particularly in a public university uh, you know the first thing you you do is you go off and you get media training because you're going to be uh, questioned by sometimes skeptical uh, journalists who are going to ask you about everything from the uh, you know from how you admit students to how you set tuition rates to why did you do this thing wrong? Yeah. Why did your football team lose? Why did your <laughs> football team uh, uh, not graduate from uh, from Berkeley uh, higher than 45%, which happened to me in my first year. Mm. And um, uh, and so you, you, know, you learn about talking to the press, but you also really do find yourself addressing public issues because of course, the, uh, the great thing about the traditions of American public higher education is that it used to be substantially paid for by the public through taxes, and it was paid for in large part because every state and uh, soon enough almost every region wanted to have uh, a local uh, university college which would advance research, which would uh, educate their student, you know, the students from that locale, from that locale and region. Uh, and it was almost a kind of, um, as you know, states were formed in the 19th century in America, almost one of the first things that you know, the citizens of those states wanted to do was to bring in and establish a university. Mm. Uh, you couldn't really be a state, you can't be a country without an airline and you couldn't be a state in the US mm. without a university. Mm. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, pride in the fact that the University of California was set up, established in 1868. It was established uh, in large part from, by people who uh, were from the East Coast, uh, there was new wealth, of course, from, you know, from first the gold rush and then uh, the establishment of San Francisco as a, as a major city. But it was a long way away from the culture and, uh, uh, and the kind of metropoles of the East Coast. Mm. And so setting up the University of California was trying to be a magnet and uh, a place that would predicate, you know, California's growth. And it had some rough times when it began, but by the early decades of the 20th century, it was already one of the top 10 universities in the US. And by the middle of the 20th century, it arguably was one of the two or three best universities anywhere. So there was a lot of pride in that, uh, a lot of commitment to, uh, uh, to, to, to supporting it. 
Um, but by the same token, uh, there was a lot of attention and attention that got uh, got in the crosshairs of American politics. And I'll just tell this one story and then I'll, I promise I'll get uh, come up to the present. But uh, in uh, 1966, there was a uh, upcoming uh, political figure in California by the name of Ronald Reagan, who was running for governor as a Republican. And uh, initially, he wasn't uh, slated to have a very good chance to defeat then Governor uh, uh, Pat Brown, Jerry's father, who had been a very successful governor in the late 50s and, and, and early 60s. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and yet what Reagan did was he, he, he focused on Berkeley. Uh, the free speech movement, which you referenced, took place in 1964. It was occasioned by sit-ins, occupations, some uh, violent confrontations between the police and students. Uh, and, um, and it was also the 60s more generally. And so there was uh, you know, some media attention to the fact that there were wild parties, uh, there were you know, uh, Marxist cells, there were uh, all kinds of uh, things going on that... Um, were either titillating or uh, or politically scandalizing, depending on how you looked at it. But mm -hmm. Reagan capitalized on this, and he basically uh, hinged his uh, hooked his campaign to the promise that he was going to clean up the mess at Berkeley, and he won. Uh, and he won uh, 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 in part because of the fact that he could mobilize this kind of popular discontent and. Uh, mm -hmm even uh, uh, sometimes anger at what was going uh, down with state funded, uh, you know, uh, uh, public university money. Uh, and uh, the first thing that Reagan did was to fire Clark Kerr, who had been the first chancellor at Berkeley, and after that, the president of the system, mm -hmm. uh, as a kind of way of saying, see, I'm really gonna, I am gonna clean up that mess. And ever since then, Berkeley has been really in the kinds of crosshairs of, uh, of everything from uh, the culture wars to uh, uh, to funding wars in states as to whether you're going to fund prisons or are you going to fund schools and universities. Uh, so you get pulled into public debates very, very quickly when you have the kind of role that I did when I went out there. And I found myself having to think much more about, you know, telling the public about the important uh, and really valuable things that the university was contributing, not just to the world, not just to its students and faculty, but to the citizens of the state of California. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's that's what I want to want to ask you about. So I, I talked to a, a variety of people, you know, here and and you know, obviously privately as well, and everyone's kind of got their finger on this problem or various problems of higher education. And it's in everything, right? It's in how we admit students, uh, various discrimination lawsuits. It's mm -hmm. in um, um, the funding that's that's there. Uh, something that, again, as a you know, a professor part time of sorts, you know, uh, and other folks that I talk to that are professors or instructors, is obviously. You know, wages can always be higher but for teachers, but that aside, is more of this lack of emphasis on quality of education in the classroom. Uh, many things are done to meet certain benchmarks or to just pass people or various ideologies get in the way, and that's more important. So uh, there seems to be a lack of quality education uh, generally, that there's a dip in that, not to say that there isn't schools that obviously still have good education. Of course there are, but... Um, so there's all these issues, and I guess just kind of the 30,000 foot view, what do you see currently in, in academia, in, in higher education uh, at large, that are some of the, the major issues uh, institutionally, and, and, and uh, what are some of the ways, you know, how we get there, you know, and, and what are some ways, I guess, out of it that you might, uh, you know, have ideas on? Yeah, well, you know, again, coming up to uh, the present, uh, what I was talking about was in a way the beginning of the culture wars, and they have only escalated. Uh, and uh, in those culture wars, the universities play a very, very big role, as you just said. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that role has only grown uh, over the last 20 years, as you've seen uh, uh, public universities substantially raise tuition. Uh, of course, state funding has gone down 
you know, there was uh, already a, a massive defunding of some public universities beginning in the 90s. But in the 2000s, and especially after 2008, after the big, great recession of 2008, 2009, states just couldn't keep up with the um, with the with the demands of 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 of, of its public higher higher education system. So, you know, state funding was uh, was diminished and uh, tuition went up. Meanwhile, private university tuitions have been going up by three, four, five percent a year, and you get a number of private universities, including the one where you teach, uh, which crested not too long ago over 50,000 a year for tuition, right? So, mm -hmm. so you have these, these, these huge uh, uh, um, uh, levels of tuition. In 2011, 2012, I think for the first time, student debt in America, the cumulative total of student debt climbed over a trillion dollars. It's now up at about 1.6, 1.7 trillion. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you sound like you know something about. Oh, no, I know. I know a few things about that. I make my payments every month, so. <laughs> well, we keep waiting to see if uh, if Biden's uh, debt relief is actually going to get through uh, the thicket of uh, of <laughs> obstacles. But uh, you know, it's it's it became a really big issue for a lot of people, and of course, it coincided with uh, with the effects of of the Great Recession, uh, which, as you have talked about, I'm sure on this program with many others. Uh, has has been uh, uh, associated with uh, just rise a further rise of glaring inequality, yeah. uh, and, um, and 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 the growing precarity not just of the middle class but of the you know the college of the uh, recent college graduates, uh, many of whom carry huge amounts of debt. Uh, at the same time that they're not getting the great paying jobs that they used to get at the same time too that if they majored in things like English or history or anthropology they were told you know why didn't you major in something that actually gave you skills like business administration or computer science right. uh, and um, uh, and and so you've had a kind of double triple quadruple whammy hit the university where costs go up uh, sense that uh, the university is not actually uh, fulfilling its side of the bargain by preparing students for actual jobs in the economy that exists. Uh, and um, and all the while, even when they get jobs, getting jobs and less, you know, they happen to go into the avenues that lead to the 1%, uh, uh, not only don't help to uh, pay back your, your debt, uh, but don't give you the kinds of things that a university education used to be assumed to give you. And, you know, at the same time, all of that is happening, uh, you have colleges and universities, some of which, you know, are, are, are ramping up their tuition and trying to uh, recruit students. Uh, increasingly, recruiting students has become difficult as we experience a kind of demographic transition. Uh, and, um, uh, and so, you know, there's uh, been in some instances a lot more emphasis, and this is obviously the uh, stuff that gets talked about all the time, the more emphasis on climbing walls than on actual, uh, you know, uh, uh, deep instruction in the classroom that would really prepare a student uh, to uh, to enter into uh, a, a career that would be uh, both meaningful and uh, remunerative over their lifetime. Yeah, well, well, that's just it. I mean, so many people will say, I'm not going to get a four-year college degree, <clears throat> have a hundred and some thousand dollars in debt. And I'm going to get paid, you know, 50,000 a year and I can just learn all that stuff on YouTube anyway. So it's fine. I'll just watch a couple of videos and, you know, read a couple of books and I'll be fine. It's the same thing. Cause you know, when I see my friends, you know, and they're taking courses, like, it's like terrible. It's not even, you know, it's, and there's, and there seems to be so much cynicism around, mm, uh, I would say a need, but, a a really good emphasis on how much a college degree, at least, or even sometimes a graduate degree is important um i guess one piece of that is you talked about it is many people have disdain for or some kind of condemnation for the arts and the humanities you know what is it, liberal arts or whatever or the social sciences in some ways and so i guess from your perspective or your vantage point um you know there's obviously this push for a kind of multidisciplinary kind of approach you know and, and many people are doing that you know and in, in my field of psychology and sociology and anthropology, we're all trying to kind of meet at the same table, essentially, right? And not be in our kind of separate corners. But what do you think now in a, a very uh, technological age and a digital age is the 
still the need or the what's the case for having liberal arts humanities uh and, and various uh, so, some social science programs what do you think is still currently even with fears of automation even with fears of uh, many things in the technological age that we still need uh liberal arts and and uh, sciences uh, social sciences and humanities programs yeah well you know i think we can come back in a in, in a bit to uh to talking about the issue of credentialing and degrees mm -hmm. and uh uh, and the kind of debates that are taking place around how you actually uh, document, as it were, what you've what you've studied. But um, but the, the the questions around arts, humanities, and even even most of the social sciences, maybe leaving economics to the side, mm -hmm. uh, are are very real questions that uh, that again, when you have the, the, this level of cost and this kind of debt and the kind of concerns about the job market, et cetera, uh, uh, they accumulate and they become, you know, very pressing questions. Now, my view is that, uh, uh, in fact, if you start jettisoning the really critical liberal arts part uh, or parts of the curriculum, you begin to jettison some of the things that are, in many ways, the most important parts of a college education. And uh, and I can and I can talk about that in a number of different ways. First of all. You know, I think you know we're experiencing in our in our in our country and in our world today a kind of growing sense of you know uh, anxiety about the future. Uh, partly it has to do with climate. Partly it has to do with geopolitical conditions. Partly it has to do with gun violence in the U.S. It has to do with a, this level of of, of both uh, uh, inequality and also political polarization. Yeah. But it um, uh, but in fact it it invites one to actually think about some of the critical questions that liberal arts courses you know actually are all about you know mm -hmm. questions having to do with you know the meaning of life with the nature of society with how the mind works uh, uh how we uh how we are how we exist as human beings what is uh, what is different between uh, uh human intelligence and machine intelligence or you know other other forms of potentially uh, extraterrestrial or whatever uh, uh, intelligence, and um, uh, and 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 there's also a, a much more practical way of thinking about the liberal arts, which is if you look at you know the kinds of amazing advances that have taken place that are taking place mm. in science and technology, you see a world in which a lot of the things that are happening are actually happening much faster than we're ready to deal with or understand. Yeah comprehend or engage in a kind of meaningful way take take what's happened just over the last two three months in chat gpt3 mm -hmm. yeah natural language processing uh has just made this incredible sort of step function advance and all of a sudden people are uh writing um papers there uh you know there was a strategic plan for a university that was very credible that was produced by chat gpt3 just a couple of weeks ago there's a, a sense that uh, you know maybe we won't need to teach writing anymore because you know the computer can do it mm. on the one hand, but on the other, we know that uh, that machines, uh, 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 however you know talented the algorithms, uh, the, the 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 writers of algorithms are who are you know who are producing these these new uh, uh, natural language processing programs might be that uh, the machines actually don't have any kind of moral compass they don't they don't know how to make judgments uh, apart from what's put into the algorithms themselves or into the databases that are feeding these these programs and you know what they say you know garbage in garbage out and that's why we've seen so much in the way of bias that's why we've seen so many instances of uh of everything from uh, uh facial recognition to uh you know to again to chat gpt3 reproducing if not actually exacerbating stereotypes mm. racial gender uh, uh etc uh that you know immediately make you think well wait a second if these machines are so talented and we just sit back and let them do all the work for us, what's going to happen to our world? It could potentially get even worse. And the need for a kind of moral voice, a moral 
uh, uh, questions of moral judgment, mm -hmm. uh, human participation at the at the most fundamental sense uh, in thinking about the future of our technology of artificial intelligence and in almost every one of its potential applications becomes all the more pressing. And I think uh, 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 makes it very clear that if you just you know decide to get rid of the liberal arts, you could find us in a in a much worse position. And then mm. the last part of this, again, even more practical, is the fact that when you talk to people, as I did as Chancellor at Berkeley, and I do now at the New York Academy of Sciences, people in, in the world of, of, of tech, they say, you know, AI is going to start uh, doing a lot of basic coding. Uh, you know, you, you, can, you can be taught how to code, but that not, that's not necessarily going to outfit you for for a job 10 years out or, or 20 years out from your degree. Mm -hmm. But you know what we what we what we need are people who are smart, people who have some sense of the world, people who know how to communicate, people who know how to read, to write and to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and to learn about uh, other things. And of course, the the capacity to learn, uh, to learn as it were how to learn is going to be probably the most important skill as skills themselves will be changing uh, again exponentially quickly over the course of the lifetime of anybody who's about to get a college degree at this particular moment. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's a really really important point, and I think it, it's something that we can, you know, not that we don't need liberal arts uh, or humanities. I mean, I obviously believe we do, but how do we how do we fashion them in a way that's a very modern 21st century way instead of just only using it in a way that's just always been done before the um the other uh, question i want to ask you is uh for for i guess a variety of reasons but so i find the culture war stuff uh, quite exhausting and and boring of, uh, in a sense in my view but um i do think it is relevant for institutions uh, especially academic institutions um, you know, there are many people that are, I think, legitimately worried and some people that are feigning worry and some people that are monetizing worry <laughs> about, uh, in academic institutions. Um, I guess one, one bit of this here. So as you said, in, in, in the, in the sixties, uh, Berkeley was known as the, the beacon of, of free speech. And it seems less that way nowadays where it is there is a lot of ways in which people need to it seems you get it not just at berkeley but in other 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 places where um there's a particular set of ideas or a particular ideology and and many people feel uh as if they cannot say certain things or they'll be you know deplatformed you know, they won't be allowed to speak or they'll be drowned out by people or um you know on and on and on and, and that there isn't this you know some people say censorship etc of course again there's extremes on all of these but i do think it is a legitimate problem where people are being forced to you know, sign certain pledges that they're committing to, you know, X, Y, and Z of diversity, inclusion, et cetera. Or um, there are other other aspects of this where they, they can't have certain things or they, you know, they say something on a Zoom call or something and a student complains and they're getting fired. And, you know, all these, we hear all of these stories all the time. How do we find ourselves in this situation? And do we find a kind of extremism of, you know, or this kind of reversal of sorts of, you know, a, a while, again, different times, right? So I don't think everything's a one to one, but in many ways, in many of these institutions did have a lot of free speech, you know, read this, think about this, play this, watch this, and let's talk about it. And let's in dialogue about it. Uh, it seems less of that now in some ways. Um, what's your, I guess, view of the landscape here within academia on these issues of free speech? um and and you know some of the you know foreboding uh culture wars that we you know still persist uh online and offline yeah well you know um it's 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 a complicated question because as you said uh you know there's so many uh extremes that occupy you know uh not so much the extremes when you get into social media these are the two positions you know it's that Either universities are 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 having to atone for the uh, for the evident sins of its of their of their origins and and long histories of being 
racially and uh, 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 exclusive, uh, exploitative, sure. uh, you know, profiting from slavery, uh, from having been slow to pick up on uh, on on the extent to which the notions of a kind of you know uh, free expression and uh, and and free inquiry uh, were nevertheless you know very much uh, part of a comfort zone for a certain kind of class, a certain kind of race, a certain kind, of, and 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 often uh, uh, for for a very male oriented society. Mm-hmm. And so you hear that. Or you hear the examples of you know super woke this and super woke that and 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 the idea that of course nobody can actually have a debate on a college campus anymore. Now to be to be uh, clear um, at Berkeley, I had to deal with a number of very tricky situations, including one in which uh, uh, the uh, a student group it happened to be the Berkeley College Republicans, but it was a student a bona fide student group invited Milo Yiannopoulos. To come yeah. to campus, yeah, and he came, and um, uh, I'd been uh, asked to disinvite him, which I refused to do. I said, you know, uh, this is Berkeley. Uh, you know, we have a tradition uh, of, uh, uh, of of honoring free speech, and you know, I'm not going to be uh, the one to say, well, that was then, and now we're not going to honor free speech. Yeah, and and besides, he'd been invited by a duly. Uh, um, authorized uh, uh, student group. So he came, uh, but before he even spoke, there was a riot on campus. And uh, in fact, there was an attack uh, of uh, of the student union where the speech was to take place. Uh, A lot of people dressed in black with masks, and this was before the pandemic, uh, 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 and, uh, and, and various levels of, you know, if not weapons, certainly, you know, firecrackers and wire cutters came and, um, Shut down the event uh, and uh, set up set off a fire that was broadcast by you know by CNN and MSNBC around the world for quite a number of hours back in early February of 2017. So, you know, there I was trying to defend free speech and uh, had a, a, a an event you know shut down uh, out of uh, you know again outrage that Milo was not just a troll and a provocateur, but very likely uh, to be directly critical, if not to try to out students who were either trans or, uh, uh, or you know, uh, some other identity that he was going after at that particular moment. So it was, you know, it was a very fraught moment. Yeah. And it was one that I was unable, even with uh, extensive use of the campus police to control. Mm. Now, I say that because, you know, I've seen uh, excess uh, and I've seen it up close and, uh, uh, and, 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 and very personal in the sense in which, uh, you know, I got, I got shellac from both sides for uh, A, inviting him and then, you know, B, uh, 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 you know, having this uh, violent event take place, even though the violence was actually enacted by people who were trying to shut it down, not by the people who were trying to keep it going. And that led then to a series of events like that that cost the university a huge amount of money to try to continue to operate, you know, as a as a as a place that honored free speech. But having said that, you know, I I have to go back to the '60s, where you know there was a lot of noise in the '60s, even around free speech. There were people contesting not just in polite debate, but in uh, somewhat uncivil uh, uh, um, uh, dialogue as well, uh, and. You also have to, I think, see some of this as a process. You know, there are a lot of new people uh, on college campuses. There are a lot of new groups that have been aggressively recruited to fulfill diversity uh, missions and agendas, but who then feel like they are being used simply to say, oh, we have this many, you know, X and we have this many Y. And they're saying, wait a second, we're here. And, you know, not only that, we have we have these views. And so people are engaged in a kind of politics of contestation that is um, that is unruly. And my sense is that, you know, there are clearly, ex- you know, excess, there's excess on both sides. I, I, I take that point. But, you know, that's sort of how history happens. And, uh, and I do think that we have to try to take a slightly 
larger view of you know what we call you know these campus wars or culture wars and 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 see it as as part of a historical process where people are are experimenting with with being given the opportunity to 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 have a voice albeit a voice that might be very loud on the college campus and it might be very very quiet if you're being beaten by a police officer if you're trying to be part of a demonstration somewhere where the, the police and possibly even a village vigilante group or two are trying to shut you down so you know it's that it's that tension as well between you know what's uh, what's going on on campus what's going on off so i just mean to say that you know i think um it's very easy to get get caught up in the kind of you know the examples of the moment that seem so clear now you know there are examples from the last couple of weeks that I think uh, are, uh, are are examples that you can you can simply say that's a kind of excess that you know that you find problem uh, problematic and troubling case of of the art history lecturer at Hamline University in 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 uh, St. Paul. Uh, you know, for example, I, I think that was uh, overreach on the part of the administration. But again, you know, this is something that is now being, you know, publicly publicly debated. There's a lot of pushback, uh, uh, and there is a uh, there's a there's a public conversation going on that then gets amplified when we're starting to talk about, you know, the, um, the governor of Florida or the. Uh, uh, or the contest uh, at the moment between between our our two political parties that uh, you know that 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 takes it into a different register and makes what's going on on campus seem almost just an expression of a of a of a moment of deep pathology in American political culture, uh, as opposed to possibly something more comprehensible, which is you know which is which is real people in real history working through. Uh, 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 issues that are, are complex for everybody concerned. So I, my question here, I have two, two parts, two follow-ups here for this is, is there, I, I'm not convinced of this. Not, I, I'd be curious to, to, to hear your thoughts on this. Everybody I feel in the moment wants to feel like their moment is unique and special and it's so different and we have so much polarization and we have so much this and, you know, the uh, culture wars and free speech, you know, bits of this here and all that stuff. And I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's, it's not good. And it's, it's very annoying in my view. Um, and, and I think it's really harmful for a lot of other people. Right. I mean, and I don't like this comparative analysis, but like, I mean, Things were really bad in the 60s and 70s too and that wasn't you know was it 50 some years ago i mean it wasn't i think each moment has its own thing so i guess there are so many people that love to make this like it's never been this bad before or it's so unique now and i don't know if you what your thoughts are on that if you agree or, or disagree with that and, and second to that is from a from a higher educational institutional perspective it must be super difficult to try and walk that line and everyone's a critic right everyone you're gonna you're gonna get shit either way right i guess in, a, in an ideal not an ideal world but practically speaking you know again each institution obviously is going to do certain things and obviously who's you know <clears throat> you know paying the bills and stuff obviously it comes into play I, I get all that but practically i guess from an institutional perspective what can they do? How can we protect legitimate free speech, but also, you know, make sure that people's uh, claims are are heard, uh, you know, adequately as well. So yeah, I guess those two questions, is it unique? Is it is it as serious as you know, people make it to be from other times? And practically, what can I guess, educational institutions, you know, do to try and have a balance of it, uh, and not too extreme in one way of how they handle it? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I've been around long enough, let me put it that way. That I, you know, I saw, I saw the '60s, even if I, uh, you know, spent most of it uh, in in uh, you know in, ju in junior high school and and, and high school. But uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, those were those were days when uh, there was a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of concern, a lot of you know of, of tearing of hair and wringing of hands about you know uh, everything's going to be. The university is going to fall apart, and in some ways, the university was reborn out of that in a way that was very powerful. 
uh, and a lot of academic movements in the you know in the post '60s uh, uh, world took on board some of these political issues, and you know, and it it was an exciting time. Certainly for me, it was an exciting time to be uh, to be studying India and to be thinking about colonialism and and empire and you know and and cultural difference and all of those things. So it is easy to exaggerate when you're in the moment. Uh, uh, what it's, uh, you know, what it means in terms of the the decline and fall of the world. But but universities um, can't just, you know, say, you know, we're going to sit back and wait. They have to obviously respond to the to the moment. And I think it's it's necessary within universities to acknowledge that there are contradictions between, for example, what we say uh, as university administrators about wanting to have a welcoming inclusive culture on campus for everybody to feel uh, as if they belong on the one side. And they only to say, there are going to be, uh, if you follow free speech, they're going to be things that are going to not just be offensive, they're going to be downright, they're going to sound downright dangerous and and and, sure. and they even create trauma. So you have to just sort of acknowledge, I think, that there's, that you're saying contradictory things. It's not, it's not going to follow a single path. And when you acknowledge that, you can create, I think, the possibility for people to realize there is a complexity to all of these principles, to all of these statements that we make. And the whole point of a college education, which goes back to the liberal arts, uh, is to um, try to understand those contradictions a little more fully. Mm -hmm. So so I, I completely agree with you, but I think it's, um, you know, we're, we're going to muddle, muddle our way through. The, the the larger question becomes for me, and this may go to um, uh, the question that you asked before, but I, I I haven't gotten to yet. Namely, how do I think about communicating science to the public? Um, uh, what can universities do to uh, uh, to represent themselves to the public in perhaps a slightly more uh, uh, adequate way, given the kinds of criticisms, the level of skepticism, the amount of disaffection that is taking place. And I think universities do have to worry about cost, and they do have to worry about access, and they do have to think more about uh, uh, even their own contradictions between, you know, how you, um, uh, how you organize your workforce on the one side and how you, uh, how you pay adjuncts, how you, uh, how you use uh, academic labor, how you, uh, how you, how you set the prices for different kinds of things that you do, which is uh, what institutions, of course, end up doing, and 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 to be uh, more transparent and 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 perhaps more responsive uh, around some of the kinds of criticisms that are out there. Mm -hmm. I also think that um, some of the structures that we have in universities tend to uh, be a little bit too resistant to change. Okay, so you uh, you and I both come from different parts of social science, mm -hmm. but you know the truth is that we're all looking at the same problems if from somewhat you know different but adjacent points of view. Right, psychologists are obviously thinking about individuals in a particular way. When you come from anthropology, you're thinking about the social or the cultural units within which individuals operate. If you're thinking as a historian, thinking about these things over time, but you know by the same token, the disciplines have sometimes been you know, sort of um, insulated off from each other uh, because of the professionalizing tendencies of universities to say this department can do that and that department can do that. And, you know, the problems that we have today, the intellectual problems, the cultural problems, the political problems and the economic problems require us to work much more together. You said, you know, to bring us all to the same table. Mm -hmm. We really have to take seriously uh, the extent to which we need to figure out how we talk to each other on campus so that we can actually talk with each other about the issues that exist off campus much more productively than we've been doing. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. And I, I think that we can't let, I mean, a few things here. I, I can't, I don't think we should have necessarily ideas over people. We have to not forsake the humanity of individuals. And in that way, we have to, I think, have a, a an appropriate uh, segregation of that, which is, you know, ideas do can have power, but the way you combat ideas, good or bad, is with other ideas. It's not by saying, we never talk about that. It's not by saying, you know, we don't talk to those people or let them talk. And we definitely don't ostracize or stigmatize people for certain ideas. 
We definitely don't do bands. I don't. I, I, I'm not really a fan of most bands. I have to really think of a few that I, I guess I agree with. But, and I think we just have to have this spirit of dialogue, where at the end you could still be at the same place, but you're having that uh, conversation. You're building on on relationships, and I think that on 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 both sides of this is a lot of radicalization and and, and polarization, which is regressive and juvenile uh as a society and 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 you know it's it's surprising when 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 folks do this and and uh you know and I, and I think it just it just you know who's gonna who's gonna up the ante right you know well you know of course you know i'm gonna put it at a seven well now i'm gonna put it at an eight now we're gonna put it at an 11 and it just keeps going and it's not helpful and and it's uh it's very frustrating and you know, it, but you know, we we have to you know keep trying, obviously. Which which leads me to my my final question. Of course, we could spend hours talking about this. I, you know, maybe it's just kind of the uh, the the synthesized version here. I know you've been thinking about this. Is you know, obviously, we had a pandemic for 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 you know, it's still ongoing. Is the worst of it was for the first two years, I think, two and a half years, and you know, we're we're doing a lot better, I think, but. Oh my goodness. I mean, the amount of absolute bullshit that was just fed, you know, on demands 24 seven, um, from people that have, you know, podcasts and from people that have, you know, obviously any kind of social media, people going online and look, I mean, uh, just I'll, last point and I'll give you some runway. <clears throat> people sometimes will come back and say, well, you know, trusting the science was, you know, was garbage. And, you know, they said it, you know, vaccines weren't going to, you know, going to make you invincible and all these things. And, and I've told people this and I, it just, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't have a master's in public health, but like, it's not that complicated. And I'm not saying this to like, you know, folks that, you know, don't have higher education. Or something. I mean, these are people that are like, you know, other PhDs that are, you know, spreading misinformation, disinformation, which is the fact of, you have a, a, a novel coronavirus. Cor coronaviruses have been around. There's a family of them. But we, we have a novel cor coronavirus that's a moving target, right? What's true for three months with the data we have is most certainly going to change in six months, is going to change again in 18 months. It's still evolving. We still have variants. And so, well, you know, it doesn't work. Or you, know, you see, you know, and to be fair, there were missteps for sure, as as is going to happen. I do think the, you know, the, the the campaign of you know wear a mask and it protects you and everyone else, going so hard on that probably past the point it wasn't necessary. You know, I think is 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 you know okay, that's a misstep there. You know, definitely all of twenty twenty, it probably made sense, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, having you know, kids in elementary school wearing it, you know, this, you know, latest, you know, last fall or something like that, maybe was a little bit much or, you know, there's, there's ways to talk about this stuff, but it's just this idea of, we can't trust any of it. We can't trust any institutions anymore. We can't trust any, any medical institutions is really problematic because in many ways, you know, we, we definitely dodged that bullet with SARS in, in 2002 or whatever it was. You know, we kind of got the, the the worser version of its, you know, evil new cousin this, this you know, pastime. But this isn't even close to a warm-up for many other types of superbugs and, and parasites and, you know, airborne illnesses that are out there and could really do damage. And it just feels like we get a big F for this kind of you know, training of sorts and, and being sympathetic and, and being able to say like, listen, you know, scientists are going to make mistakes. Doctors are going to make mistakes. It's a moving target. We evolve. I just don't understand. Now we're at this space where we can't trust anybody, as you've obviously known that people in, in upstate New York weren't getting their kids the MMR vaccine, which is preposterous. And we had a measles outbreak up there, or whatever it was. And you see this all over the place. And it, to me, it just feels like a very privileged kind of decision you can make when there's people in in the continent of Asia and the continent of Africa and the continent of South America that would, you know, absolutely give, you know, their their next meal so they could get a vaccine. But people here, are, you know, can get it and they're just choosing not to get it. And then they're getting measles. It's just an absolutely privileged and distorted view of things in my mind. And so... I guess all at the same, what can we say, I guess, in, or what are your ideas on 
how to actually um, you know trust medical and public health institutions. Uh, not necessarily trusting the science. I think, again, that was a bad slogan. I mean, obviously, part of science is questioning, hypothesizing, going back, reworking it. I mean, this is maybe a bad slogan of sorts. But, you know, how, how do we trust, I guess, the question is uh, institutions of, of of medicine and public health and and in uh, science, again, for for something like this or, or, or many other things uh, that we need to rely on on folks that have spent their years and career doing this stuff. You're absolutely uh, great questions. And, uh, you know, and on the one hand, uh, I thought initially, as I think many others did uh, during the early days of the pandemic, that the extraordinary speed with which vaccines were developed, especially, of course, the mRNA, yeah. but also, you know, also the, the J&J vaccine and other uh, live, you know, live virus vaccines uh, would have, if anything, uh, been you know great advertisements for the power of science in the 21st century they absolutely yeah people would sort of say my god you know the science you know the science is it is pretty amazing yeah the speed with which this happened as you as you know from prior uh experiences it took years you know to develop this i mean they were developing the first vaccine within weeks of getting the genetic coding for it in january and february of 2020 right uh, and of course, it took time because of the clinical trial process, which you can shorten, but you can't stop if you're going to attend to human safety. And that was obviously a very critical and critically important part of the whole rollout. Um, but you know, I, uh, I I think like everyone else, uh, you know, we were we were looking at uh, what seemed to be uh, an extraordinarily public global demonstration of the power of science. And of course, here we are, as you just described, in a world in which, uh, you know, misinformation, disinformation, uh, prejudice of different kinds, uh, fear, uh, uh, stroke, ignorance, uh, has uh, uh, has enlivened, uh, you know, a, a history of skepticism about science that seems to be just running amok uh, uh, everywhere and in places you wouldn't expect. I mean, uh, it's. Uh, clear that there are divides between those who have different levels of education including college education but even there mm -hmm. as you as as you also said there 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 disagreements and uh, and and people who will just uh, have a kind of default position of distrust and distrust that seems to be greater for vaccines than for some other kinds of medical treatments uh you know the vaccine really does, despite the fact that vaccines whether the measles vaccine or the polio vaccine or Whatever it might be, I mean, it's 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 transformed human health. Yeah, it's transformed human health in some ways more powerfully than any other single uh, 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 scientific invention. I think you know it's it's fair to say that that vaccines are correlated with longevity, uh, uh, perhaps more powerfully than anything else that that has happened in the world of, of biomedicine. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I think I think we've learned, however, some other things uh, over the course of the last three years. One is that when you when everybody is watching science in real time, there are mistakes. Yeah, people will say things, you know, that it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's spread by fomites. You know, you have to be uh, you know, you have to uh, sterilize every surface. Uh, you know, the slowness with which masks were recommended, and then you know, as you just said, uh, you know, the fact that masks were seen as uh, as a sign of your of your of your commitment to the body social, not just to yourself. Uh, you know, took on then, of course, a kind of life of its own, as did so many other things uh, around around our public health uh, responses to the virus. But uh, but here, you know, it's it, it's 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 again, it speaks to you know how much complexity you can build into public outreach about things like the the meaning, nature, and truth of science. Science is authoritative precisely because it's constantly about testing something. It's constantly about trying to uh, 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 figure out whether or not you got it right the first time, uh, changing your mind, having debates. Uh, 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 almost every scientific paper is about trying to change the way in which you think about something that was written before about the same problem. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that you could use the slogan, just trust the science, follow the science, uh, is, you know, inadequate. Uh, and of course, it also 
feeds into everybody's, uh, uh, you know, almost exasperation over the fact that, you know, one, one week you have a study that says, uh, you know, eat more meat, another week, you know, eat less meat, drink coffee, don't drink coffee, uh, no alcohol is, uh, is, 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 is good for your health. Uh, exercise routines, uh, you know, you can do a few short bursts of uh, high intensity exercise, or you have to walk for, you know, 46 minutes a day. Right. And, you know, we're all, you know, kind of reeling from this. And I think, you know, it, and I'll just, you know, finish with this, perhaps, um, at the New York Academy of Sciences, we, 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 we're, 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 we convene conferences, we publish papers, we give awards to scientists for extraordinary work that they do uh, to recognize and support the work of science in all kinds of fields. But we're also very concerned to reach out to a broader public and try to convey the excitement of science for young people who we hope will consider a career in STEM, but for everyone who uh, we think needs to do two things. One is understand the extraordinary rigor with which science is conducted, but also understand that you know, science is not fixed. It's going to change over time. It's going to be, uh, it's it's going to it's it's going to follow these zigs and these zags, and uh, and as a result of that, we actually will benefit from being part of the conversation, knowing more, and then participating more. And sometimes scientists are not very good at communication, and sometimes scientists just assume that if you just say this is the facts, and you know everybody's going to get it. Uh, but like every other human activity. It is a messy one, and it is one that requires uh, a broader public to engage with in order to understand. So we're trying to take all of the lessons of the pandemic, the ones that are powerful that we can all point to as the as examples of the extraordinary power of science, but also you know the the levels now of not just polarization but of skepticism about about every uh, every 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 public institution that is connected with 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 scientific discovery and often with recommendations about what that means for the way we might live our lives and say look let's you know let's not let's not say it's exempt from criticism but let's let's set the ground rules that we're going to we're going to talk about the science of it and not about the fact that it is prima facie just you know something you can't trust mm-hmm. so otherwise we're going to be in a you know, we're going to be in a really dangerous place. And we have both, you know, new viruses that are mutating out there. We do have new technologies that are being developed, new possible effects of, of, of climate change. I mean, we all have to figure out how we're going to engage these questions. And there's an obligation on the part of institutions like universities, but also on the institutions that are part of our civil society that include the media and include the kinds of conversations you have on your podcast to try to open things up and invite people to realize that you know they can be part of a serious conversation about these issues and we, we can all be the better for it going forward yeah, no I, I i wholeheartedly agree with, with with everything you said there and i think that's that's what's really 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 important uh well uh, Nicholas, I, I, I greatly appreciate you uh, coming on and, and, and talking with us about all these important things. Your, your uh, wisdom is, is much appreciated. Uh, where can folks uh, find your work, um, find what you've written, and uh, you know, just find where you're at uh, uh, generally uh, online or anywhere else? Well, I have a website, uh, which is smallcasenicholasbdirks.com, and that gives uh, both a, uh, a bibliography of things I've been writing recently. It um, gives my contact information. And uh, currently, uh, as uh, as we noted, I'm president of the New York Academy of Sciences, which is in, in New York City and uh, 115 Broadway in downtown New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, I've been thinking a little bit about these questions around the university. So I actually have a book that's going to come out in a year or so. Uh, nice. Maybe we can talk about it then. Yeah, of course. Uh, Sounds wonderful. Uh, when, it, when it comes out on the university. And um, and I'm, uh, I'm now writing a book about the problem of relativism in mm. the way we think about everything from science to social science. Mm. So uh, love to hear from people. And, uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today and uh, really enjoyed our conversation.
No, no, no. The, I mean, the pleasure's all mine. I, I really, really do appreciate your, your time and energy and all the work you're doing. And, and uh, hopefully people check out your work and uh, would absolutely uh, love to have you on again. So uh, thanks so much.